Hi, this is Paul. The, this little corner has been growing a lot lately. I don't know if, if you've been noticing it. Some of, some of the channels like Grail Country and Ken Lowry's Climbing Mount Sophia have been bringing in authors and um, having them converse with some of the principals in this little corner. And this is expanding things. It's going to be interesting to see how this goes and where's where this goes. Now, of course, um, John Verveke brought in D.C. Schindler in many ways via his book. And then Ken Lowry went out and uh, grabbed him via the Internet and Zoom. And Ken has had a number of conversations with, with uh, David Schindler. And I, I bought David Schindler's book uh, on the prompting of John Verveke. I started, I've started reading it three or four times. It's, it's, and, and I'd start reading it and I found it very impactful. And I, I, I just, I just wanted to reread some of the parts of it because I, I could see, I could sense that there were things there that I wasn't fully grasping. But yet, as, as I've discovered, you know, with, with some of my other conversations like Jordan Wood that I had uh, via Nate, I really have to get back to Nate about, um, because Nate's been lining up people too. Oh. Part, part of what the challenge of this little corner is going to be trying to figure out how to maintain platforms and connections via an increasing number of people. I mean, when, when we first started, I mean, Jonathan Peugeot, when I first started my channel, Jonathan Peugeot had 4,000 subscribers. Verveke didn't even have a channel. I started with 15 for the Freddie and Paul show and went up from there. And now bringing in, especially some of these intellectuals who are authors and um, people who are, you know, people who are writing some pretty significant books, it's a lot to keep up with. So we'll see how this whole thing can sort of uh, grow in this way. I, 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 you know, John is a John is a scholar. John Verveke is a scholar. Jonathan Peugeot is an icon carver and a symbolist in many ways. And I'm a pastor, and pastors are sort of like sheepdogs. And and so adding more people in just adds more people to my consciousness about okay how can we have events how can we how can we set up platforms how can we have conversations and we can and what we have just this mass proliferation of videos more than any single one of us can keep track of a lot of the sub channels a lot of what grim grizz is doing and what chad is doing in terms of um sowing and reaping and the clock tower and so there's a ton going on. Then, of course, you've got other specialty areas. Like I said, you know, Nate keeps pulling in more people. Uh, Jacob keeps wanting to highlight, you know, the Jewish contingency. And it's it's a lot. It's a lot. But uh, forward we go. And this conversation, uh, the symbolic, diabolical, and Luciferian, what a tremendous conversation. Really enjoyed it, and John. I haven't even I haven't really had a chance to keep up with, with John's new series after Socrates. He's been talking to, um, this monk Maximus and having tremendously interesting conversations with him. And so there's just so much going on. But I wanted to get into this because this conversation was really foundational. I think, in some ways, connecting Verveke's Neoplatonism, his concern with Socrates, and of course D.C. Schindler is himself a Christian. Very interesting conversation with Ken Lowry about Schindler's background, and now connecting with Peugeot about some of the some of the the pieces that Peugeot has been bringing in. Part of what I've continued to realize is that as I continue to listen to Jonathan, as I continue to listen to John, as I continue to listen to more voices coming in, um, you know, I, I continue to, I think, have a better understanding. A, a lot of this stuff takes time to sink in. And I think, I think a lot of, uh, oh, i got to answer a tech. So let's jump into this. I'll say from my side, um, the notion that words might 
me like might be connected to the reality of the thing that the the word mm. by which we designate the thing might actually be connected in some meaningful way to what the thing is itself yeah um and, and that i i hope that's a, a reasonable way of putting what you're what you're talking about well at least for sure the act of naming you know and okay. i think that that's right. that's right. something that you find in scripture right there in genesis there's a sense in which yeah you could call it pointing right this is Mathieu, my brother a long time ago really crunched in on this you know this idea of pointing and pointing in the very sense of like you know of of, of directing the vision and then directing it towards something you know where you you want the person to see it as one like you want the person to say oh that's one thing like that's mm. that's something uh that that's somehow related to naming or to what it is that adam was doing in the garden uh and so the the act of name there's a deep interpenetration between our capacity to perceive reality, you know, to perceive unity and multiplicity and naming. Uh, and that's why you can understand. It. Like, it actually makes you understand. Now, in many ways, what Jonathan just laid out there has been at the heart of what he's been doing for the last five years. And it's been at the heart of, well, I, again, I don't think you have to get away from a, materialist perspective sort of this world of objects like jordan peterson talks about at the beginning of maps of meaning where somehow the world is just all full of these objects and of course what cognitive science what the attempt to create uh thinking seeing machines has led us to is that all of this conceptualization happens not physically but um, and not even sort of psychologically within our own heads, but it happens communally. And this, of course, leads to the realization of what, again, we might call hyper things or, or things of this nature. And I, I can pull in, um, I can pull in um, Greg Enrique's um, diagram here, which I think is so helpful. This, this clipped from Mostly Not Working, if you follow him on Twitter. Mapping reality in four dimensions of behavior according to the, the theory of knowledge system. And John Verveke talks to Greg Enriquez. I've had a couple of conversations with him. But I, I thought this was really helpful because it, it helps show that a table, I'll make it a little bit bigger, a table is not just a table that our interaction with the table involves all sorts of things. For example, we don't notice the legs of the table or the legs of the chair, and we don't see them as distinct things. If in fact, someone was sitting on the, um, sitting at the table on a chair, we would notice, even though they are, <clears throat> they are continuous, we would distinguish between the person sitting at the table and the table itself. We would distinguish the person sitting on the chair from the chair itself. And we would do that completely, seamlessly, without thinking, automatically, whereas we don't distinguish the back of the chair from the chair, or the tabletop from the table, or the legs of the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a ton that goes into this that, in many ways, in modernity, we were sort of naive to. But right away, let's say, if you're playing around with Photoshop, or now we've got you know quite a bit fancier apps on the phone. If you want to sort of have the table without the person or the person without the table, then now sort you know the Google Tensor chip, for example, is supposed to be optimized to help distinguish the outline of the person from the background. I don't just disappear into the bookshelf as you see me here. You see me as something different from the bookshelf. Now, it helps that I'm moving and the bookshelf is behind me, but this is this is a lot of what we're talking about here, and this is exactly what Jonathan is, is pointing out um, in terms of naming, because in, in many ways, once you name it, something else is added to added to the reality. I understand a lot of strange things, even like magicians, like strange things that happen in the renaissance that this kind of this ma magical idea of how names function there's something that's not completely untrue about that uh of course as christians we we believe that it's not simply an imposition of the will or or something that is idiosyncratic to me but rather that when you name properly then you participate in the actual order of of reality 
That's uh, yeah. I mean, I uh, it's it's interesting um, that you begin with scripture there, and I mean, it's 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 really compelling what you say. It's uh, it's interesting. I, I sort of come to that through through Plato, um, and uh, the the uh, uh, I mean, he basically says exactly what you said there. Um, uh, in fact, um, he you know he he. Uh, he puts it in terms of naming and and the, the purpose of it in the first place is to make clear, make manifest the, the nature of things. Um, and that really is a, um, a, a unity and a multiplicity that, that makes the thing intelligible. And uh, and the, the other word that he used is to describe this is uh, uh, sukogogia, uh, a leading of the soul. So I mean, it's just that it it's it, it, on the one hand it makes a thing manifest. On the other hand, it draws the soul, the the attention of the person into right. into the thing, and it's not at all just an arbitrary act of will. Um, it, and, and that's an amazing because it's it's something coming together. And I think in some ways this is this is sort of like the Vervakian transjective. Um, when I interact with the table. And of course, philosophers have been playing with ideas like this the whole time. I mean, idealists will say, "Well, well, the table is in me, and you know, I maybe I can't have, you know, can I actually interact with the table itself?" And um, I mean, philosophy has been whirling at this kind of stuff for a very long time because many different systems of knowledge have tried to sort of capture it and there are always loose ends to these systems that doesn't that don't really let things um let things really sort of settle it's a participation that the language of participation is really is really inevitable here but may, may i um uh just one of the last things jonathan you had said before uh, uh at the end of your opening comments i, I um i'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, uh, you know, hear you sort of expand that a little bit about um, the difficulty in communicating this. And, and uh, you know, it's, um, let me just say a couple words about that and see what you think. But <clears throat> it seems to me uh, we can't get outside of symbols. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in, in, in fact, the, the, the modern consciousness is governed by, by symbols uh, and in such a radical way. Um, I mean, what, what's odd is that, and this might be the difference between the you know pre-modern and the modern world. In the pre-modern world, people recognized <laughs> that symbols w had this importance, and we we deny it. And it seems that we we end up in a way becoming more controlled by the symbols that are at work. Um, that, that's a tremendously important statement that he just made. There was, oh, there was sort of a bias that arose in modernity that reduced symbols um, and, and sort of set them aside where, and, and, and dismissed ancient dismissed the ancient function of symbols. And what you know is becoming immediately increasingly more apparent is that this move was a reduction. Now, of course, there are many things that came in the modern era that we are certainly not forsaking or doing without. We, we gained certain amounts of, um, I'm always struck by the, the image of, of Odin losing an eye in order to gain knowledge. And I think in many ways, that's sort of the modern bargain, what we did and I, it, it seems to me that's one of the reasons why it's difficult to communicate this is precisely because of the, the symbols that, in fact, are governing our our age and modern consciousness and so forth. I mean, would you agree with that or would you? No, I totally agree. Yeah. I, I agree. And I and I think that it has something to do. It's a whole it's a and I, don't, I use big words, but it, it, there's a whole Luciferian mm -hmm. line, you could say. And so the the notion is that. Symbolism is a social construct. That's the way it's presented to us in, right. in popular parlance. You know, you hear that at, in the universities. And so because of that, what's hidden behind the idea that symbolism is a social construct is power. It's yeah. the notion that symbols are, are, are ways to influence things and are ways to impose power on, on the world. You know, Jacques Derrida, he talked about forces of interpretation and he yeah. 
he, he kind of went into that try obviously he wasn't he wasn't a Nietzschean kind of but what it implies is nonetheless that there's something about about symbolism that is will and and imposes itself through construct and then in that then there is this notion that we need to free ourselves right from symbolism in order right. to be free and in order to be completely ourselves or whatever that means but there's yeah. a sense in which we have to kind of free ourselves from symbolism uh and then on the flip side of that is something even worse or something even crazier which is that we have to oppose symbolism with a reverse symbolism with a kind of upside down symbolism in order to deconstruct the symbolism that's there and it ends up actually ends up setting up something like a, an upside down hierarchy of symbolism yeah yeah it's, it's again a nice i don't know how much time we're going to have to make this video but um, again part of what's happening as we continue to talk is i think it, it, i gotta finish my sentences Part of what's happening as we continue to talk is we are growing both in hopefully our clarity, our ability to articulate and communicate in a way, and for those of us who have been listening for a while, uh, an ability to understand and to catch up with these ideas. <laughs> Again, the resonance, it's, it's, it's amazing. You, you use the word Luciferian. I use the word diabolical. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and of course, diabolical is it, that's the etymological opposite of the symbol. It's it's what what um, uh, you know sets asunder, uh, yeah. tears apart, as opposed to joining together. And I, there's, I think the, there's a little difference between the two, and you're they're totally related. I completely yeah. agree. the 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 Luciferian is okay. the is the the use is the let's say the the second light or the. The one who bears light, who thinks okay. they have it all, right? Who doesn't mm -hmm. see the sun, who thinks the, the light belongs to them. And so right. therefore, the, the Luciferian instinct is that use of power. It's like, I'm going to use symbols to control others because I am the source of reality. But that oh, and, and Jonathan, just before, nicely tied that to this, this idea that this naming and pointing is arbitrary. And right away, they had mentioned earlier that these these things aren't arbitrary. There's there's a participation that's going on in this. And if you go back a few years in the conversation, we focused a lot more on emergence versus emanation. And so the in a sense, the the naming would be an emanation. Back to C.S. Lewis's book Miracles. Part of why, if you read that book, uh, Reason has a capital R in many respects is because getting, sort of breaking through this, this world of enormous multiplicity and complexity is, as Lewis would call, reason. And that's, that's probably not too far from the way that John Verveke wants to recover and rehabilitate reason from how it's been reduced by the sort of the new atheist style chatter but but and, and I've, actually, I've also been thinking a lot about the video i made about scott adams and his nihilism and what he said about about ai and and language systems thinking about you know, to, to joey um, I, I was talking on Twitter about um, collective cognition, and Joey made a, a, a comment about collective cognition. And I said, you know, every time you read a book, you participate in in cognitive outsourcing. And when every time I watch a video like this, I am I am outsourcing. I am looking to to David Schindler and Jonathan Peugeot and Ken Lowry to to use some of the processing and the learning and the growing that they've done and sort of level up from there. And this is one of the amazing things that human beings do. We might see it in, in very rudimentary ways in the animal kingdom where maybe one crow sees another crow use a tool or one chip sees another chip use a tool. But we do this on a scale that is just vastly, vastly different from anything else we find in the animal kingdom. And But then the, the question with with all of this and, and because we struggle to to know things better and more deeply and at a deeper level 
we, we first sort of borrow the words and we play with the words and we repeat the words and, and eventually we hope to sort of break through with this participation. And it's very interesting that, that Lucifer goes by his own light. And, and if you imagine that all of this pointing and naming and narrative making is merely arbitrary and an imposition of will upon the world, if the world is sort of reduced to just that, then of course, well, in a sense, you've got a, a, a renewal of, of the sophistry that was, that was talked about in, in, let's say, Plato's dialogues. But the the hope of this is that in fact there can be knowledge and truth and and in fact connection and participation with god in the in the process of of knowing the truth and in, in the process of using these words ultimately is diabolical that's what it ends up doing so there's actually a strange relationship between pride and the fall right between Right. Between pride and and uh, and and uh, multiplicity, the Tower of Babel is a great example. Where, and if you go too high, then everything shatters. So there's a, there's an interesting relationship between those two moves in culture. Yeah, yeah. So no, that's helpful. So so Lu the Luciferian would be more a, a deliberate control, taking of control of the symbolic order, and therefore invert. Right, bringing your own light. I think about in Leviticus nine and ten when. Uh, Aaron's sons are killed because they bring strange fire to the altar. In in a sense, instead of waiting for the Lord to to light the altar himself, this God who is a consuming fire um, consumes the sons, consumes the wood, and of course shows up in in at Carmel as well. So burning it in all. One of the things on my list is to continue to wrestle with. what on earth we're trying to talk about when we talk about the Luciferian, um, the diabolical, and the demonic. Because part of, part of what happens in modernity is that there's a, a real loss of, a real loss of symbolism, which of course is Jonathan Peugeot's whole project, a real loss of symbolism in our connection to it. And, and so, in a sense, we want to sort of hop over modernity and go to pre-modernity and, and perhaps, hopefully, be able to re-engage and to bring some of those things over. But I don't think you can do that with it, without sort of bringing them through modernity and, and having to do that sifting and that translating because what, what happens after modernity is not just going to be a before modernity. It, I think this get, very much gets into, you know, the Owen Barfield... Um, participation and loss of participation um, as as we as we sort of move through this all these ways yeah or, or at, at least at first at least at first trying to to control it in 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 well, it's interesting it's just it's weird to understand what, how it is that happened and so there are tyrannies right there are moments where symbolism mm -hmm. is controlled like you could say Hitler and the Nazi regime was a, was a perfect example where very, very powerful symbols, very ancient symbols were, were kind of brought into oh, their it. ideology and used to impose their ideology on the people. Uh, and so you have that. And then, then you have this weird deconstruction, which happens as a, as a reverse, as a carnival. The way we understand it is carnival. I use mm. that image quite a bit, is that people... There seems to be an intuition about how uh, inversion festivals and carnival works, and then it's a weaponizing of that to destroy order. But what it ends up looking like is something like an upside down clown, you know, uh, pastiche of order. You know, it's yeah. like the drag queen is a great example of that, where it's like an upside yeah. down symbolism used to destroy the, bina the, the binary nature of gender. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it precisely introduced, I mean, you know, the, the, the drag queen story hour, or I found myself a few days ago accidentally at a, uh, the be beginning of a drag queen bingo. And I mean, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, these, these are the, the precisely the, what's being infiltrated is something so simple and childish and, you know, um, uh, ordinary. Um, that, that's where the, 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 um, 
reversal of, of the subversion is is going into what's most ordinary. Yeah, there's something really extraordinary about that. And the the people, I mean, the the subversion of symbolism is once you understand it, it's not it's not people just have to stop being shocked about it. It actually is quite coherent. It has a logic to it, even if it is the logic of disorder. You know, disorder has a meta logic or it has a way in which it happens. It's not arbitrary. Um, and and really, the inversion festivals or carnivals are the best tool to understand mm -hmm. what's happening and to understand how, in some ways, we have a yeah. carnival. But that it's it's curious. I mean, carnivals belong to traditional cultures typically, and and um, uh, th th there's they have a place it seems in a symbolic order. Um, yeah, they represent the end. Is how yeah. we understand it. Yeah. Whereas it it seems what's going on now is not. It's not simply that that has taken up more ground or something. It's it. It seems like there's a much more radical overturning of principles. Well, it's a. You could say it's like a. It's like a cosmic version of a carnival. It's a larger mm -hmm. version of a carnival. So you can imagine that that uh, you know carnival functions in a certain way. Usually once a year or a few times a year, you'll have a carnival. Depending on cultures, it'll be at different times in the in the year. But it usually does represent the end. Yeah, and the beginning, you know, or the end, moving towards a transition of some kind. Um, you know, if you think of the feast of the fools in the middle. And again, if you think about what Jonathan Peugeot talks about when he talks about the fact that we're nearing an end of something, this is the this is the basis upon which he says this. The ages, it was it was usually done at the end of Christmas time, you know, before the transition back around the feast. It was the feast of the circumcision. It was a, made. It was like carnival, right? It's like you remove the flesh, just like Mardi Gras. It was it yeah. happened at the Feast of the Circumcision, uh, and so it's like a celebration of flesh before you remove the flesh, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and so you could understand it as these are little moments that 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 um, manifest the 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 shape of the world, because yeah. the carnival actually has a geo a geometric aspect to it too. Which is, is that one's harder for sometimes for people to understand is that. What happens at the end of the year happens on the end of space. Mm -hmm. that, that's why you have gargoyles on, outside of churches. That's why you have, you know, uh, marginalia and inversion and subversion and, and humor and whatever. Sca scatological uh, references in marginalia in, ma in medieval manuscripts. And if you look at an ancient map, you know, if you think of how Pliny described the world, you know, it went from the center, from the, you know, the umbilicus of the world to basically monsters and chaos and inversion, right? The Amazons are, are inversions of, of society yeah. at the end of the world. So, so we can understand it. If we see the pattern, then you kind of see it play out. And then you realize, well, well I just kind of, I would say we're at the end of something. Like, yeah. it's, not, it's not, I'm not, I'm not just it's, saying that yeah, because I feel yeah, it. I'm just yeah, saying that yeah, because I, yeah. I had a vision. I didn't have any vision. It's just, you can just notice how the world works. And it's like, we're definitely at the end of something. I mean, I, the, uh, uh, yeah. I guess uh, what what you say makes it. It's, I mean, it's fascinating and and uh, and really illuminating, and I appreciate that. I, um, but <laughs> and this is and and it's it's moments like this because you have to imagine, you know, DC Schindler's an academic. He but he's also a human being. He's got a family. He's got. Um, you know, he talks a lot about his father when he when he shares a story, and there's there's a fair amount of um, mutual um, storytelling that that goes that goes into this. And Jonathan Peugeot does a nice job in in terms of going through um, going through his story in this, and and so then I I do think I said, well, how 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 are we going to maintain this conversation? How are we going to how how are we going to help it scale in a productive way? So I just made a video. Now I have to probably release that one before I release this one. I, I just made a video about the the conversation that was on Jacob's Just Chatting channel with respect to. Um, Sam and CW and, and many others talking about their talking about their struggles with with a local church. 
and and scholars have in, in many ways sort of always had to navigate this. C.S. Lewis, Chad brought up C.S. Lewis in that conversation. I don't know if it made the, I only took an hour out of it. It was a five-hour conversation. But, of course, C.S. Lewis had to learn to listen to clergy and um, D.C. Schindler. There's a reason churches sort of scale in different ways. You have different churches for different groups, et cetera, et cetera. But the questions are going to be how how can... How can this little corner scale using these tools that we have? Um, because we're, we're long past the place where I can listen to everything that Jonathan puts out or John puts out or Jordan puts out, much less Nate and Jacob and Karen and Sevilla and Ken. And, and now I know I've left out lots of other even smaller channels, and so please don't be... Um, I didn't put a list in front of me. And, and that's by no means a, a hierarchy of order, but, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's, let's let them talk a little bit more. I've got I've to land the plane on this and figure out what I'm going to do with all these videos that I'm making. I, I, I still, I want to get at something. I mean, uh, 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 carnivals are fun. Yeah. You know, and and what what is characteristic of our age is not that people are having too much fun; it's that they are radically depressed, and there's a there's a there's a lack of. Um, uh, it's not even so much the 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 monster; it's the void. Um, uh, there's Those are related. There's, there's something. <laughs> they just certainly are related. You have to understand it. See, and and so part of what's interesting about this is that, of course, for a lot of us and especially for, let's say, the symbolic world corner of the corner, um, when he's, when when Schindler says that, lights go off. Oh, oh you know, the monster in the void? Yeah, and Jonathan's going to dive right in and talk about that. I, I remember early on in the Jordan Peterson moment, the first live event that I was able to go to was an event in San Francisco, and it was put on by a guy who was doing stuff called the simulation and... You know, I went with Rick and Mike and a bunch of the people from the meetup, and we drove together to San Francisco, and we went in there, and it was immediately obvious that the guy interviewing Jordan Peterson had not listened to anywhere near as many hours as the rest of us had, and so he's saying things, and it's like, you know, how uh, is Jordan going to be gracious with this guy? He was gracious with the guy, but he was just saying a bunch of things that you knew Jordan had talked about again and again and again and again. And so here, Jonathan, well, you know, explains it one more time. And again, there's nothing bad with the re-explaining because getting the reps in, you you explain it better and you have more practice doing it, and that helps widen the audience. But yeah, you know, I didn't intend to talk about scale so much in this video, but the more I watch it, the more I think about it. Yeah, the best yeah. way to understand it is inebriation or, or wine, right? It's like yeah. it's wine. Wine is fun, you know, uh, but you have to have a dose of it. You have to have a right. little of it. And so chaos is actually pleasurable. Chaos actually is a kind of can be a little bit ecstatic because it it uh, it kind of draws you out of yourself and puts you in contact with a kind of fluidity of, of reality. And so it's it's not there's nothing it's not bad. But yeah. it has to come at the right place and in right doses. If it, if you just drink wine, then then you will be sad and depressed, right? It's like right. if you just if you just eat cake, if you just eat eat the uh, icing on cake, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to last very long. Things are going to things are going to spiral out of control for your life. But there's nothing wrong with cake, with cake. Like there's nothing wrong right. with. With with a with a with a with a hint of chaos is the way to understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah. it even it even has it might even have something mysterious about it. Like yeah. um there's something about ambiguity which is which is which can be in the right place and in the right dose can actually be a vehicle for the sacred, right? The cherub seems to be something like that, or at least a right. guardian or a, a holder, like a seat, let's say, for, for something sacred. Uh and that's what and and if we don't understand that, we won't understand what's going on because that's the that's what they're playing on. That's what the whole madness of our situation is playing on a little hint of truth 
about the relationship right. between ambiguity and sacred. And so then the, then, then the, the, the let's say people that are kind of holding the narrative right now go all the way, right? You saw, you probably saw recently the, uh, in, on some Anglican church in the U S right. It's, it was like, it was like, uh, God's pronouns are they, them. Yeah. That's yeah. where we're going, by the way, we're going towards not just that this is acceptable, not just that this is okay, but that this is actually religious. It's a transcendent yeah. image. Yeah. The drag yeah. queen is sacred. That's where yeah. we're going. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, sacred in a very strange sort of. In well, but there's always a relationship between the sacred and the prohibited. And you'll hear Jordan you know, starting to sort of criticize Ron DeSantis and he had an interesting conversation with Christopher Rufo, because in a sense, if you, if you outlaw the drag queen, you participate in making the drag queen sacred, because there's always a very interesting relationship between the prohibited and the sacred. And, and you don't get rid of that, which is exactly Peugeot's point again and again and again, that fringe belongs on the fringe and center belongs in the center. And when you have proper order, you have center and fringe. You don't, in fact, I mean, part of the, part of the difficulty of the Protestant Reformation was, in some ways, they were Puritans. They attempted to, um, to if you get rid of all, if you get rid of all, chaos or disorder, you fall into the danger of tyranny. And so what, what you need to do, proper order involves center and fringe. And, and that's why you've got to be really careful with your prohibitions, because what you wind up doing if you work prohibitions in the wrong way is you wind up creating a new sacred and that's going to send the system in a different direction. I have to figure out if I'm going to leave it here or if I'm going to go to the end of the conversation because some things really got going there and then Jonathan ran out of time. Now this was really interesting. They got into alchemy and whenever you get into alchemy, you know, funny, funny things happen. But, and, and of course Schindler's a Christian. He's um, he, he himself is not a fringe character, okay? And so they talked about the Bible, the imaginal. Um, any, anyway, the whole, the whole conversation was good. And so if you, if you haven't watched it, I certainly recommend it for your, for your stream. I, I don't have enough time to, to walk through the whole thing, but, but very much enjoyed it. And it's obviously given me a lot more to think about, not only in terms of, the, the content of the specific video, but in terms of the question of how does the how does the corner scale as we bring in more voices? You know, I had the conversation with Jordan B. Cooper, so you know another uh, sort of classically Lutheran Protestant voice, and, and we certainly are sort of lacking other um, formal Protestants. Although I believe Schindler's a Protestant, um, Jordan Wood is a is a Catholic, um, uh, Chris Green, Episcopalian. How, how are we going to grow this thing? That's, it's a, it's a challenge. Anyway. Um, yeah, highly recommended.